Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. My name is Amy Proal. I'm a microbiologist, and I'm also the president and chief scientific officer of PolyBio Research Foundation. We're a research nonprofit based in Boston, and we pull together different teams, different scientific teams at different academic institutions to study what we call infection-associated chronic disease, so conditions that are initiated or exacerbated by infection. In long COVID and MCFS, two conditions that I'll talk about today, two infection-associated chronic conditions, are central to the research program that we've developed at PolyBio. Today, I'll be talking about persistent infection and viral reactivation as a driver of common MECFS and long COVID pathological or disease driving mechanisms. It's important to understand that if you look at the scientific literature and you interact with enough teams studying viral activity or bacterial activity, or sometimes even fungal activity, and the chronic consequences of those infections, every, nearly every well-studied pathogen is connected to a chronic syndrome in a portion of infected patients. So the RNA viruses, we're very familiar with SARS-CoV-2. We know there's chronic uh, symptoms that develop in some people on COVID. Also, though, the previous SARS virus, also a subset of patients got chronically ill. Enteroviruses, Ebola virus, there's post-Ebola syndrome, post-Zika syndrome is another condition where people, a subset of people develop chronic symptoms after infection with Zika virus, dengue, measles, influenza. Also, when it comes to bacteria, Borrelia, Bartonella, there's other bacterial uh, pathogens connected to chronic symptoms and syndromes, and also the DNA viruses, the herpes viruses, which I'll mention a little bit more in my talk as well. So overall, we understand that this important trend can happen with a lot of pathogens, and the two conditions that we look at most in this capacity that we're studying at PolyBio are the patients who develop a portion of patients who develop chronic symptoms after SARS-CoV-2 infection. Those patients are given the diagnosed long, diagnosis long COVID, or in some cases, post-acute sequelae of COVID or PASC. And then we have the diagnosis myalgic encephalomyelitis, or ME-CFS, uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And those cases develop after different infections, uh, pathogens, including the enteroviruses, which I'll discuss more later, and author, also herpes viruses and other pathogens have been implicated in the onset of MECFS cases. Um, and in some cases, some bacterial pathogens as well have been, have been tied to the MECFS diagnosis. Now, when we're talking about these infection-associated chronic syndromes, where people, a subset of patients, don't recover after getting an infection and develop chronic symptoms, there are two central key trends. I mean, there's, there are several trends you can study, but two really stand out as some of the most basic central uh, biological mechanisms that can be studied. And one is pathogen persistence. It's a very straightforward possibility that in the patients who develop chronic symptoms, the infecting pathogen does not fully clear from patient tissue where it continues over time to provoke the immune response or modulate host gene expression or even metabolism. And the persistence of a pathogen such as a virus in patient tissue over the long term in a chronic state, we've termed in long COVID, at least, a reservoir of the virus. The important thing to understand when we're studying the topic of pathogen reservoir in conditions such as long COVID or MECFS is what I mentioned before, which is that if a pathogen persists in a patient with chronic symptoms, it's very rare for that pathogen over time to easily be identified in the patient's blood, or sometimes even in other fluid samples, such as saliva or urine. And that's because in very simple terms, the blood is a place where the immune response is very robust and the pathogen can be more easily targeted. And so again, in simple terms, the pathogen will move into tissue where it will hide in a sense in tissue where it's better protected from the host immune response. And so what that means is when we're talking about reservoirs of these pathogens, persistent small amounts of pathogen that have not fully cleared from patients with these conditions, it's very important that we understand that the study of fluids such as blood and urine and saliva alone will never get us far enough to fully understand the contribution of persistent infection to long COVID and MECFS. And in fact, overly relying on those studies can confuse the field when it comes to the topic of pathogen persistence. Whereas the study of patient tissue where the pathogen would actually be expected or in a growing number of studies is being shown to persist is extremely important. So the study of patient tissue, patient nerves, and the brain and the central nervous system, which are other reservoir sites. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, 
but it means that in order to best uh, or honestly study these conditions and really understand what's happening to patients, we have to collect tissue samples from patients. We have to do biopsy studies where we get tissue. We also have to have a good autopsy program for these conditions, which is something I'll mention more later. Now there's another trend that is key to these conditions, which is that someone might get an infection. For example, let's say they're infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The SARS-CoV-2 virus can mute or downregulate parts of the immune response as it drives disease. For example, it might downregulate, and it can in many cases, signaling of interference, which are key molecules that target, um, keep other uh, viral and bacterial, uh, especially viral pathogens in check. And so as the immune response becomes compromised, it produces an environment in which other pathogens already harbored by the patient can themselves reactivate and potentially infect a new body site or drive new chronic symptoms in a manner that can drive disease. And the herpes viruses um, are key pathogens that may reactivate in patients with both long COVID and ME-CFS. Most of us acquire, 99% of the human population acquires herpes viruses over the course of a lifetime. These are Epstein-Barr virus, HHV6, HHV7, HSV1. And these viruses remain in often dormant or latent states where they're not driving overt symptoms. But again, an onset of a new infection may disrupt that immune homeostasis, allowing the herpes virus or other dormant pathogen to reactivate, produce protein, and drive new symptoms. So I'm going to focus more today on the persistence. Both of those trends are important, but I'm going to focus more on the first trend, which was the straightforward possibility that the pathogen that starts a person's case, whether it's long COVID or ME-CFS, simply does not fully clear from all their tissue and persist in what we call a tissue reservoir site. Now, recently, our team wrote a paper about SARS-CoV-2 reservoir, this exact topic, in post-acute sequelae of COVID, PASC, which is also called long COVID. The group that wrote this paper is a group that we have uh, brought together to work on the topic at PolyBio. Um, we've created a consortium of researchers from different academic institutions in the U.S., uh, some in Sweden even, um, and in different countries to study uh, SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in depth using tissue biopsy studies, high-resolution imaging studies, and all kinds of other innovative techniques that are able to help understand if a person still hasn't cleared the SARS-CoV-2 virus from various body sites. And this group uh, got together, as you can see, are most of the authors on this paper, and we wrote the paper to provide clarity in the field on evidence thus far, because there's growing amount of evidence showing that patients with long COVID still harbor SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA or protein in different tissue types collected sometimes weeks or months or even years after acute infection. And then to discuss the mechanisms by which persistent viral RNA and protein can drive symptoms in these patients or other disease mechanisms and then to provide clarity for the field on how to continue to move forward and study pathogen persistence in long COVID, uh, including the development of clinical trials, for example, combination trials of antivirals, monoclonal antibodies, and other therapeutics that might, we might be able and, and should begin, which is one of the things we're working on, to do to be able to try to clear SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in patients with long COVID. So if you look at this slide, this is how we define SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in the paper. We say some individuals with PASC may not fully clear the SARS-CoV-2 virus after acute infection. Instead, replicating virus and or viral RNA, potentially capable of being translated to produce viral proteins, persist in tissue as a reservoir. So we don't know, and we have a number of studies underway to better understand the activity of the virus in a reservoir site. In some patients, for example, the virus may still be replicating, may still be producing protein. In other patients, it might be in more of a, uh, a I would say dormant, but an inactive state um, for periods of time, but then replicate, uh, produce protein during periods where there's immune exhaustion. So those mechanisms of RNA virus persistence are also something that our group is working to study in long COVID. This is a table taken from the paper, and it delineates studies that have found SARS-CoV-2 RNA or protein in samples months, or as I mentioned before, in some cases, over a year after acute COVID. And while some of these studies were not designed to measure long COVID symptoms, they nevertheless provide evidence that SARS-CoV-2 is capable of persistence in numerous reservoir sites, including sites in the brain, the central nervous system, in tongue tissue, in olfactory tissue, in GI tissue, many different tissue types. Now, here's a really interesting study 
that um, was done by Tim Henrik and team at the University of California, San Francisco, and supported via part of our long COVID research consortium. And what this team did was they found, they got gut tissue biopsy from the GI tract, the tissue of, of, of patient colon tissue via uh, colonoscopy uh, procedure. And they did find spike SARS-CoV-2 RNA detected in five, there were five patients in this uh, early study. Five of the long COVID patients, all five of them that underwent these uh, colonoscopy biopsies from 158 to 620, uh, 76 days following initial COVID symptom onset in the long COVID patients. And signal was primarily observed in cells within the lamina propria, again, at the colon tissue. Now, what was interesting is these five patients were part of a larger cohort of patients who underwent also underwent high resolution PET imaging to identify T cell activation throughout their bodies. Specifically, the team used a novel radiopharmaceutical agent called 18FARFARG, which is a highly selective radio tracer um, that allows for anatomical quantification of activated T lymphocytes. And in patients with long COVID symptoms, they observed modestly higher uptake of this tracer in the spinal cord, in the hilar lymph nodes of the patients, and for example, colon rectal wall in participants. And we don't know if this T cell activation is occurring due to viral reservoirs, SARS-CoV-2 reservoirs in the patients, but it's a possibility. And it's definitely making us think that reservoirs of SARS-CoV-2 and long COVID likely extend to body sites, including the spinal cord. Also an important finding in long COVID that speaks to SARS-CoV-2 persistence in patients with the condition is multiple teams and a growing number of people actually are reporting the finding of SARS-CoV-2 protein in patient blood. For example, here um, are several of them. Now, I explained that the genetic material, the pathogen itself is likely not in patient blood, but it does seem that even when the virus persists in a tissue reservoir site, SARS-CoV-2, that some protein, for example, the spike protein may be able to leak off the virus in the tissue reservoir site and get into the circulation where the protein can be measured if you have tools that are sensitive to enough to identify it. And this leakage or transport of the viral protein into blood may occur in exosomes or extracellular vesicles. So for example, two of the studies that are on this slide did find SARS-CoV-2 protein in long COVID blood in exosomes or extracellular vesicles. And in some cases, up to 12 to 16 months post-COVID in these patients. And the fact that the spike or other SARS-CoV-2 proteins are increasingly found in long COVID blood up to 12 to 16 months post-initial infection does suggest that some long COVID patients may harbor replicating virus because there would have to be virus that continues to produce the protein that gets into the blood to be measured. However, thus far, the levels of spike differ among studies and among cohorts that have been found. So this is an ongoing area of research. Now, if we go to MECFS or myalgic encephalomyelitis, I'm going to focus on the myalgic encephalomyelitis part of the MECFS, basically diagnostic uh, label word. Um, the, the, the illness was actually called ME only, which I have on my slide for a long period of time. And if you look back at what myalgic encephalomyelitis means, myalgic uh, stands for muscle pain, encephalo means brain, myel means spinal cord, and itis means inflammation. So encephalomyelitis it means swelling of the brain and spinal cord. So that's what the early researchers who were studying ME and the study of ME has happened for decades. That's actually why they gave patients with this condition the name that it has. And I think it's important to think about the fact that I just mentioned in long COVID that we think that the, the brain and spinal cord, and we see increasing evidence actually, may be reservoir sites of the SARS-CoV-2 virus that actually the patients, uh, people who named ME were on the right track because swelling of the brain or spinal cord in these patients could be due to reservoir of other viruses. For example, the enteroviruses. I think that they are one of the most important um, types of virus that we should be studying in patients with ME. Just to understand the history of ME, um, there were outbreaks um, where patients were given the ME diagnosis that happened in multiple places over the course of 
the 1950s and the 1960s. This is a paper in The Lancet published on May 26, 1956, that documented several of these outbreaks. You can see from um, groups in uh, England to groups in Iceland, for example. And to the extent that was possible, and here's the thing, it was very hard. The researchers or the people who came to try to understand why the patients in these outbreaks were sick had very limited tools with them. The tools that we can use in 2023 to try to understand if someone is chronically infected with a pathogen were hardly available to the people who tried to investigate these outbreaks. So in many cases, they could not identify the pathogen that had uh, initiated the person's case, which is why you see unknown on the slide. But when they do identify the pathogen or at least strongly suspect what they think may be driving the cases, they tie them to the enterovirus family, which I mentioned before, which are the poliovirus type family of viruses. So you see poliomyelitis, Coxsackie viruses, which is a type of enterovirus, um, and other enteroviruses. The reason that ME became known as benign myalgic encephalomyelitis is not really because benign means that the patients are okay at all. It simply me meant that it wasn't fatal, like some cases of polio were fatal. And again, since these researchers had the polio viruses in mind as they were studying these early cases, that was something that mattered to them as a distinction. Now, to better explain the enterovirus, since they are single-stranded RNA viruses acquired via respiratory infection, but they also commonly reach the gut when they do infect patients, where they can also drive GI symptoms or symptoms along those lines. Patients infected with an enterovirus can develop severe disease, or they can have a mild or an asymptomatic infection. Enterotis, enteroviruses are not often studied for their chronic capacity, but they have been shown capable of persistence. I'll show you some examples actually in patients with ME-CFS or ME, um, and they're actually under study for their persistent capacity in some patients with type 1 diabetes. And the non-polio enteroviruses cause about 10 to 15 million infections and in tens of thousands of hospitalizations alone in the U.S., just in the U.S. So when I read these uh, characteristics of the enteroviruses to you, if you know SARS-CoV-2, you know what stands out is how similar the enteroviruses are to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 is also single-stranded RNA viruses. It's also acquired via respiratory infection. It can also reach the gut. Cases can also be severe or they could be mild or asymptomatic. And so one of the greatest parallels to study between long COVID and MECFS may be SARS-CoV-2 reservoir in patients with long COVID and enterovirus reservoir in patients with ME or MECFS. Now this is, and you can actually find studies where for a long time, the study of enterovirus activity in ME was actually one of the most robust areas of inquiry. Um, this was more along the 1970s and 80s. Um, you can see studies, if you look this up, this is just a snapshot from a webpage where enterovirus RNA or protein has been found in skeletal muscle tissue from ME patients, in the gut tissue. I'll show you an example of ME patients. And in two autopsy studies in the brainstem um, and uh, several other brain regions of patients who underwent uh, an autopsy with an ME diagnosis. This is a really, really important study done by John Chia's team at the Enterovirus Research Center in California. What John did is he got stomach biopsy tissue. This is very, very similar. Remember this, the study I showed you where Tim Hendricks' team got the colon tissue from the patients with long COVID? This is John Chia doing this years before, actually, the, a very similar thing where he's collecting stomach tissue from patients with ME or chronic fatigue syndrome via an endoscopy, colonoscopy type procedure to get the tissue. And then what he did is he stained many of these uh, stomach biopsy samples obtained from the ME patients, and he's found enterovirus uh, genetic material and VP1 protein in many of the stomach biopsy uh, tissue samples from patients with ME-CFS, and it's worth reading this study. The high proportion of patients in the study did have RNA uh, protein and genetic material in their samples, and John has done another paper, at least, where he connects um, enterovirus activity to ME. So overall, another interesting parallel between long COVID and ME may be the persistence of SARS-CoV-2 or enterovirus in the gut in the GI tract or uh, GI tissue of patients with both related diagnoses. Now, in our review article, if you remember the Nature article where our team wrote about SARS-CoV-2 reservoir and long COVID or PASC, we delved into the mechanisms by which persistence of the virus in tissue in a reservoir site 
might be able to drive a further disease. And this is a diagram from our paper that discusses those mechanisms. Now, I'm going to discuss these mechanisms in the context of SARS-CoV-2 reservoir, but I think it's important to understand that they also pertain to ME-CFS when it comes to the enteroviruses or to other viruses that could be involved in ME-CFS cases. Here's one mechanism. RNA and protein can engage host pattern recognition receptors to modulate the immune response and drive cytokine production and inflammation. Also, repeated recognition of persistent protein by host adaptive immune cells could drive immune exhaustion or um, alter differentiation of virus-specific T cells and B cells over time. And we do see in long COVID studies, uh, several that have found signs of T cell exhaustion in long COVID. And there are several teams working on T cell exhaustion in MECFS, which is a, a smart area of inquiry. Because if the T cell is continually responding to reservoir of virus that is not fully cleared, it will be active as it does that, but over time it may become exhausted and it will display markers of exhaustion. And that's what these studies are looking at. Also, SARS-CoV-2 proteins could modulate host metabolic, genetic, and epigenetic factors to drive chronic symptoms in the absence of overt inflammation or cytopathology. This is important because you don't have to have, like I say, overt inflammation right near identified viral RNA or protein in a sample to mean that there's disease occurring in that area. And that's because viruses and other pathogens can hijack our metabolism and, and alter the expression of our human genes, which are two major ways that they drive disease. So this is why our studies that are studying SARS-CoV-2 reservoir and long COVID and also some in MECFS go beyond just looking for viral RNA and protein and are also using additional technologies to try to understand the gene expression, the upregulation and downregulation of human genes and the immune response near identified RNA and protein so that we can better understand if persistent pathogens are driving immune or genetic abnormalities in these patients. Also in long COVID, spike or S1 protein could contribute to fibrin amyloid microclot formation or vasculature damage. Now, if the person, let's say, still harbors virus in the gut, what can happen is the lining of the gut can become permeable, and that might allow the spike protein, as I mentioned before, not the virus, but the protein to leak in those extracellular vesicles into blood. If that happens, that might seed, at least partially, the formation of fibrin amyloid microclots, which are these deposits, little clots that are being found in the blood of many patients with long COVID. In fact, this team actually did an experiment where they took platelet poor plasma from patients and they added the SARS-CoV-2 S1 protein to the healthy platelet poor plasma in fibrin deposits similar to those identified in the microclots formed. So there's a, a strong connection between the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and these fibrin amyloid microclots. Now, we, and I was a, worked with Recia Pretorius and team on this study, have identified similar fibrin amyloid deposits in the blood of patients with MECFS. Now these clots are not usually as, they're not as resistant to breakdown would be one of the key trends that we, we observe. The long COVID clots are really resistant to breakdown or what we call fibrin lysis, whereas the MECFS clots are a little easier to digest and they're also smaller as, as, a, as a general uh, finding. Um, that's probably because the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein is really unique in its capacity to drive coagulation or clotting processes, and that may contribute to how resistant those clots in the, in the long COVID patients are to break down. But enough of the proteins from pathogens involved in MECFS cases may still be able to seed similar forms of fibrin or platelet activation, um, just with not as not as great a severity as the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. And so, for example, we don't know exactly why the MECFS clots are seeded, but certainly pathogens produced by other viruses implicated in MECFS, for example, the enteroviruses or also herpes viruses are implicated in MECFS cases, sometimes even bacterial organisms that might come along for the ride if the gut becomes leaky and get into blood could be part of all the, the catalyzing of uh, fibrin that occurs in patients with the MECFS uh, diagnosis. Now, another thing that we uh, can consider is in, in the patients with long COVID and MECFS is that if they don't fully clear the viruses like long COVID, SARS-CoV-2 and terovirus or herpes viruses that become involved in their cases, the immune response could, could sink. That's what I mentioned before. And that could facilitate the reactivation of herpes viruses. We kind of have this relationship with herpes viruses in these cases where um, the herpes virus activity that we see in these conditions 
may be in some cases a secondary response to a failure to clear a pathogen such as an enterovirus or SARS-CoV-2, the, the driving pathogen. And as the immune system weakens, we see the herpes viruses reactivate in ways that could drive actually common pathology in patients with long COVID and MECFS. Also, antibodies created in response to SARS-CoV-2, this is in long COVID, could cross-react with host proteins via molecular mimicry. The same could be true with pathogens implicated in MECFS. And associated immune dysregulation can facilitate microbiome dysbiosis and intestinal barrier permeability. So this is definitely an important trend. Let's say in a patient with long COVID or MECFS, either the SARS-CoV-2 virus or a virus like an enterovirus is not cleared from the gut. Low-level inflammation generated in response to that reservoir might allow the gut lining to become more permeable. And as that happens, that could cause inflammation that causes the ecosystems of organisms, the microbiome, the communities of organisms in the gut to shift towards a state of balance, towards a state of dysbiosis or imbalance that has been tied to the development of chronic symptoms. This could happen in the gut. It could also happen in the mouth because we know an increasing number of human body sites have microbiome communities. So in other words, the persistence of a pathogen could bring along with it in a sense the collective imbalance of the ecosystems of organisms in a patient with long COVID or MECFS in a way that begins to drive yet other symptoms and forms of dysregulation in that patient. Also, last but not least, associated inflammation sensed in response to a pathogen reservoir um, could be sensed by chemoreceptors of the vagus nerve and trigger microglia activation in the central nervous system resulting in sickness response symptoms. And in my last part of this talk, I'll go into this mechanism just a little bit more. Here are some of the central symptoms of long COVID and MECFS, the flu-like symptoms, the malaise, the sore throat, post-exertional malaise, which is a truly, truly terrible inability to recover from exercise, autonomic dysfunction, pain, nausea, cognitive dysfunction, sleep problems, headache, muscle, and joint pain. Now, if you look at in this area of the brain called the brainstem, it's a region in the back of the brain, and it's very interesting to consider as a, as a site that may be impacted in patients with both MECFS and long COVID, because the brainstem is where the vagus nerve enters the body, and nuclei or nerve bodies in the brainstem control what's called the sickness behavior response. So when the body senses inflammation, and the vagus nerve conveys the signal to the brainstem in response to an unresolved infection or just in, resolve, in response to inflammation, the body mounts what's called the sickness behavior response, which is flu-like symptoms, malaise, a, a, as a signal to say, to tell the body, you're sick, you feel ill. And that response can drive many of these uh, flu-like symptoms. There are also nuclei in the brainstem that control pain and nausea signaling, and also overlapping nuclei. And you can look at this paper. This is another paper I wrote with my colleague at uh, Harvard Medical School, Michael Van Elziger. It's uh, another paper on long COVID mechanisms um, that I can send to put in the chat later, where you can look more closely at these uh, overlapping nerve bodies because several or uh, two others also control autonomic functions such as heart rate and breathing. So the vagus nerve to better describe it is a very important nerve that innervates every major trunk organ of the body and connects to the brain at the back of the brain, at the, at the brainstem, that area I just described. And so let's say someone has not cleared SARS-CoV-2 from their gut, like that study I showed you with Tim Hendrick, where one of the patients had SARS-CoV-2 RNA, spike RNA in their colon tissue up to 676 days after infection. Low level inflammation in response to that reservoir might be sensed by vagus nerve conveyed to the dorsal brainstem in the brain, and then those nerve bodies, their signaling is thrown off in a manner that results in sickness, pain, nausea, and autonomic symptoms, some of these key symptoms of long COVID, noted in long COVID patients. Now in a patient with ME or an ME-CFS diagnosis, perhaps as we saw in that study with John Chia, that patient has not cleared an enterovirus and the genetic material and protein from the persistent enterovirus infection activate low level inflammation, is sensed by the vagus nerve, and is conveyed again to that same area in the brainstem that controls the sickness behavior response and pain signaling and autonomic signaling to result in sickness, pain, nausea, and autonomic symptoms. And this person might meet the MECFS diagnostic criteria. So in other words, the, the vagus nerve sensing to brainstem is a, is a really 
logical way that reservoir of different pathogens in different body sites, because vagus nerve doesn't just innervate the gut, it innervates the lungs, it innervates other trunk organs, reservoir of SARS-CoV-2 or other pathogens in all of those body sites could potentially stimulate this vagus nerve to brainstem signaling in a way that would result in these common symptoms that we see in patients with long COVID and ME-CFS. Now, one possibility that we're interested in that we will continue to study is that the vagus nerve could be directly infected. Let's say the vagus nerve were directly infected by SARS-CoV-2, it wouldn't be one of the more straightforward ways that patients with the condition would often develop sickness, pain, nausea, and autonomic symptoms. Let's say in ME-CFS, the vagus nerve is infected by enterovirus, who knows? or by a herpes virus. For example, one of the herpes viruses that can reactivate in patients with an MECFS diagnosis or in some cases is connected to the onset, such as Epstein-Barr virus. Well, if the vagus nerve were directly infected by that herpes virus or enterovirus, that person would very likely develop sickness, pain, nausea, and autonomic symptoms that meet the MECFS diagnostic criteria. So overall, while long COVID and MECFS are not the same condition, I think it's important to say that because overall, we need to study them separately because they involve different pathogens as onset. And, and the SARS-CoV-2 virus and spike protein can do different things than the enterovirus proteins or the herpes virus proteins that are more involved in MECFS cases. While there are different diagnoses, if the virus is involved in them, can persist in some cases and can in impact common signaling pathways, as we see here, for example, with vagus nerve, that's one of the areas of, of research that will probably be most fruitful that we're working on as we move forward. Last but not least, here's a study which did find in acute COVID patients in an autopsy study that vagus nerve was directly infected in several, in, in most of the cases in patients in the study. This is a good paper Maureen Hansen uh, recently wrote on uh, enterovirus activity in MECFS largely, which is really good to read and understand. Um, and last, I just want to end on this note. To understand pathogen persistence in long COVID and MECFS, we must push for autopsy studies, tissue biopsy studies, imaging studies that can help us understand what is happening in the brain and spinal cords of patients with these conditions, fluid biomarker studies that can find low level amounts, for example, of the spike protein, as I mentioned before, or other viral proteins in patients with MECFS or organoid and animal studies. Our long COVID research consortium is working hard on these topics in long COVID. We have a number of tissue biops biopsy studies and imaging and other studies underway. We're working on iterating several of those into MECFS, and we have a growing number of MECFS tissue types, although we, we still honestly need a little bit more investment in that space from groups like the NIH or private donors that can help us move along. And last but not least, when we get these tissue samples, we do need to understand the activity of the pathogens that we find in those sites. And as part of our research program, we're bringing in these really cool sequencing technologies, for example, spatial transcriptomics or single nuclear RNA sequencing, microbiome-based technologies that can identify all the ecosystem in a tissue sample or other technologies that can characterize the immune response in really specific ways, such as B-cell receptor sequencing or T-cell receptor signaling. These technologies are gonna help us understand not just the patients with long COVID and MECFS harbor persistent pathogens, but what those pathogens are doing to drive disease. With that, I'll leave it for now. Thank you.